All right, hello and welcome. In this video, I'm going over three advanced Python concepts you should be aware of. After watching all the way through, you will understand when and how to use each of them. I walk you through concrete examples taken directly from the Python for Finance field. And if this video or I suddenly disappear, just assume someone didn't want this knowledge out there. Let's get into the first concept, parallel processing. Example, you are calculating sharp ratios for a list of assets, maybe 20, maybe 100 tickers or even more than that. And you're wondering why it's taking forever. Thing is, each individual calculation is fast, but when you run them all together, it stacks up. Why? By default, Python runs them one after the other, or in other words, it runs them sequentially. It finishes the first sharp ratio, then the next, then the next, and so on. All using just one CPU core, while the rest of your machine sits idle. That's where parallelization comes in. The idea is to stop doing everything one by one and instead spread the work across all available cores. One of the cleanest ways to do that in Python is with multiprocessing pool. You are essentially saying, here's a list of things to calculate, split them up and get them done in parallel. So let me show you what that looks like in code. So. As you see, I got some libraries imported here. So why finance, pandas, numpy, nothing new until here. And then I'm importing pool from multiprocessing, which is going to take care of the parallelization. I'm also importing time to just showcase the performance difference that can make. So I'm measuring time of the sequential process and the multiprocessing process. Now, this function calculate sharp ratio is just calculating an annualized sharp ratio for a given asset. So you see, I'm passing ticker here, so let's say Apple, and then I'm just downloading stock price data, calculate returns, calculate the mean return, send a deviation, then the sharp ratio, and in the end, I'm returning the ticker, so Apple for instance, and the sharp ratio value. So this function in a nutshell is just calculating a sharp ratio for a given ticker symbol. This function, backtest portfolio sequential, is taking an array or a list of tickers and it is then calculating the sharp ratio sequentially. So you see I'm measuring time here, start time, so I'm just creating a timestamp for before doing anything in this function. So whenever I'm calling this function, I'm measuring time and then this is doing something. And what it is doing? It is just calling this function calculate sharp ratio for a ticker in the tickers list. So let's say you pass a list of Apple, Microsoft, Tesla here. This is calculating the sharp ratio for whatever asset I set first, Apple, then Microsoft, and then Tesla. And after it is through with those sharp ratio calculations, I'm putting or I'm pulling the timestamp. With that, I can calculate how much time passed. This is what I'm doing here. So I'm just subtracting the start timestamp from the end timestamp. And with that, I'm getting how many seconds this took. In the end, I'm also outputting the results. Now, this is where things get interesting. This is the function doing exactly what it did before, but in a multi-processing kind of way. So what exactly is this doing? Same story as before, I'm measuring time before doing anything. And then I'm creating a pool which automatically uses all available CPU cores. Pool map takes our calculate sharp ratio function and applies it to every ticker in the given tickers list. But instead of doing it one by one, it runs them in parallel across the processes in the pool. Once everything is done, we again stop the timer, print how long it took, same story as before, and return the results again as a dictionary. Now, let's run all that code. And you see, I have a tickers list here, Apple, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, and Tesla. And what I'm doing here is first I'm printing out, I'm running the sequential backtest, then I'm running the parallel backtest, and in the end, I'm doing a performance comparison here. I'm doing that because both functions return the time they took. 
executing. So let's execute that script here. And then you see I'm running the sequential backtest here. So some stock prices are getting pulled. Took 1.45 seconds with the sequential uh, backtest. And when I'm doing that in parallel, I'm only taking 1.22 seconds. And now you might ask yourself, okay, you saved 0.2 seconds. So what's the point of you telling me this? Well, I passed five tickers now, but imagine I'm extending that and I show you what is happening. If I just extend that by two tickers here and execute that again. So it's running the sequential back tests and it took 1.9 seconds and the multiprocessing took 1.32 seconds. So you see already with these few assets, the performance comparison is quite distinctive here. All right. And now imagine that for hundreds of tickers, this is a game changer and this is therefore a super important concept. You should know and you should know how and when to apply. Next up, concept number two, using async IO. This one is all about live data. Let's say you are fetching the current price of Bitcoin from multiple exchanges, Binance, Kraken, Coinbase, whatever they're called. Each call is fast on its own, but if you do them one after the other, it adds up. And this time, the problem isn't your CPU. It's just waiting on API responses. This is an IO bound bottleneck. Your code is sitting there doing nothing while waiting for data to come back. So instead of using multiprocessing like we did before, we use async IO. It lets us fire off all the API requests at once. And while one exchange is still responding, Python can already start talking to the next. That's how you get extreme speed benefits. So let me quickly walk you through the code. Just as a side note, I'm not going over the arbitrage calculation here. So in a nutshell, what this is doing mathematically, it's just calculating the price difference between different exchanges here. But you don't need to understand this calculation in order to understand what those async IO setup is doing. But let's start from top to bottom. So I'm using the CCXT library here, simple crypto library, which enables you to connect to multiple exchanges using obviously async IO here and time to showcase you the speed benefit compared to not using async IO. Now let's start with the async IO part here. We got two functions and you see that these are async functions because you see that the notation here in front of the function definition is async. Now the first function fetch price async fetches the price from a single exchange. It's marked as async def because it uses a weight inside specifically when calling exchange fetch ticker and later exchange close. That tells Python this task might pause and while it's waiting, it's okay to do something else. If this function wasn't declared as a sync, Python would throw an error the moment we try to use a wait. But that's not the only reason it has to be a sync. In the main function trade a sync, we are calling fetch price a sync for each exchange and passing those calls into a syncio or a syncio dot gather and a syncio dot gather expects a list of so-called coroutines. In other words, it only works with functions that are declared as async dev. If we pass in regular functions instead, the whole thing would break. Python wouldn't be able to schedule or wait them. So to be clear, fetch price a sync is a sync, not just because it uses a wait, but also because we are using it inside an async system that relies on it being awaitable. Now, inside trade a sync, we first create all the fetch tasks. Nothing runs yet. We are just building a list of so-called coroutines. 
Then we use await asyncio.gather on task, which starts all of those tasks at once. Python sends off each API call, and whenever one pauses to wait for data, it switches to the next one. So instead of waiting for Binance to respond before even starting Kraken, we launch all three and handle them as the data comes back. Once all the responses are in, we collect them, filter out any errors, and we are done. So the big takeaway is this. AsyncIO doesn't make any one task faster, but it avoids wasting time. It lets your program stay busy while waiting for external data, which makes a huge difference when you're dealing with multiple APIs. Now, rest of the script is just doing the comparison. So this is how the fetch price function is looking if you're not using asynchronous functions. So this is a synchronous function. So just the normal Python function. This is how this function would look like, all right? And you already catch or might catch the difference here. And that is how the trade sync function is working. So this is just the main logic again. This is also pulling the previous function, but you see it is pulling it sequentially. So it's pulling Binance, then Kraken, then Coinbase and so on. Now, the cool thing about all those functions here is I put in a time tracker to show you what enormous difference it can make if you're using AsyncIO here. Now you see, this is what I'm doing here. So AsyncIO lightning fast without AsyncIO so. So with, within here, I'm calling the synchronous function and within here, I'm calling the asynchronous functions. So a lot of talking, but let's run the script. And with that, you will be convinced that this is a concept you should definitely check out. So you see, lightning fast, Binance, Kraken, Coinbase, AsyncQ, took 3.52, so by the way, right pronunciation is asyncio. I'm just saying it wrongly because of, I don't know, because maybe I'm stupid. So you see here that the comparison is, we have asyncio 3.52 versus the normal way, so sequentially, that is 140% faster. Think about that. Think about this enormous time advantage you have using async io all right last but not least concept number three using decorators this one is all about keeping your code clean especially when it comes to logging and tracking performance let's say you have a function that pulls price data or maybe even does some calculation sometimes it works sometimes it fails and you also want to know how long it took First obvious way to achieve that is sprinkle print statements everywhere. <laughs> I'm doing that all the time, that's perfectly fine, but there is a better way as using print statements get messy fast, especially if you're doing it in multiple places in your script or on a code base. So a cleaner solution to use is a decorator. Basically a function that wraps around another function and adds extra behavior like logging, timing, or error handling. So here in this script I set up, you see a decorator. So this is my defined decorator called log performance. This takes any function, wraps it in a helper called wrapper and returns that new version. The wrapper tracks how long the function takes. So this is going to happen here. Whether it's succeeded or failed, that is going to happen here and prints all of that out automatically. So any function you decorate with log performance, so you add that using add and then log performance, gets this behavior without changing the actual logic of your function. So Right, we use it here on fetch price, which pulls live prices from Binance using the CCXT library. If the call works, we get a success log with timing. If it fails, for example, because we pass an invalid symbol, it logs the error and still raises it properly. Now, to show the difference, we also have a second function down here that is fetch price no decorator. So you see, 
how much stuff you have to add here, right? So it does the exact same thing, fetches a price, but we've written the logging manually inside the function. At the end of the script, I'm just running both versions over a list of symbols here. So you see I'm passing BTC USDT, ETH USDT, and invalid symbol just to pass a, a malicious code, not malicious code, but wrong code in uh, resulting in an error here, right? So let's print that all out and see where the difference is going to happen. So let's execute this one. So you see with the decorator, so that is the fetch price function, you see a nice output here. So you got the uh, output that the fetch price worked. You get the execution time here and you get uh, the price super nice. And if you're getting an error, uh, you also get that here, all right? And without the decorator, you see that all of the prints you have to manually add would also be printed out, but you see the obvious thing with the decorator, the logging is clean and consistent. So you instantly see which symbols worked, which failed and how long each took without touching the original function body at all. So again, you see this big difference here. Super useful in bigger code bases or in bigger projects you are using. Now, I hope these concepts added value for you. I hope you found this interesting. Let me know if you have any questions, if anything was unclear. And yeah, if you like this kind of content, appreciate you leaving a like and a comment to push the nasty YouTube algorithm. Thanks a lot for watching and looking forward to see you in the upcoming videos. Cheers. Bye-bye.